crucified people. And whenever you see a picture of the Lord, he has a loincloth on. But the reality is he had nothing on. And, um, and the very first result of the sin in the garden was um, they discovered their nakedness. And uh, then they hid. And so in order to recover um, us from that place of shame and fear, he was crucified with nothing on at all for everybody to see. And um, so anyway, there's like a lot of you know, heavy stuff where he's concerned, but I could picture him, you know, sitting around laughing. Has anybody ever been hit with the oil of joy where you're laughing so hard, you're gonna pee your pants, or you're curled up in a field position and everybody's face looks really weird? Have you noticed that? <laughs> when you have the oil of joy, like you can look at people and they just look funny. If you've never experienced that, you need to ask for the oil of joy. Because and make sure you're around people so that yeah. it's even more fun. But um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. We're actually going to finish um, chapter 13 of Romans. Believe it or not, we are making progress. Man, that was just that was just fun. Was that not just fun? I had a lot of fun. <laughs> I have a lot. Mary Alice, you notice I'm wearing my necklace? I did. That's the first thing I see that on your neck. That's good. It's all good. What oil do you have in the two favorite? I put gathering in it. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily like the smell, but I'm just drawn to it. And um, so, yeah, it's gathering. That's what I'm confusing. I was looking for a top of the line leather, leather person. For the little yeah. thing on the inside? Yeah, because leather's better to put in there. So right. It's, it's working really well. Good. Just gonna have to do that more often. <laughs> Just like, I'm still kind of in the mm -hmm. worship high. <laughs> that was just cool. I had never, I had never kind of, you know, I had enjoyed the playing, but tonight was different. It was, wasn't it? Was it? So, so deep. I mean, oh, it's. I could have heard it all night, and not yeah. one minute before. And what was neat is they were shifting when the, the subject matter was shifting. I don't know if you guys noticed yeah. that, but when it was time to go to a new, you know, subject, they would shift. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. It's just <laughs> Top of the line. So cool. All right, so I'm going to talk about love tonight, and um, I think a lot of us have some misconceptions of what love is. <laughs> You're an object women stuff. <laughs> but um, a lot of times people think that God love is a feeling. It's absolutely not a feeling. Um, he can move your emotions uh, with love, but that actually gets into the affection part. Um, and I'm going to read you guys. Have any of you ever heard of Rick Renner? Okay, he has a fabulous book. All his stuff is wonderful. He's very deep. Um, but his uh, Sparkling Gems from the Greek, it's devotional and every day. <laughs> so, I just keep looking at you just y'all giggly. I don't know why. Yes. I have a word for Mary Alice and Share it? Do you want to share it? or? Because if so... Uh, May we turn off the recorder? Yeah, let's... Well, you know what? I'll edit it out. Okay. And put it separate. Because I guess since you said love, it just confirms it. <laughs> um, just the Lord wants to tell Diana that to, um, to lay everything at his feet. And, um, and for you both to cast your cares and worries upon him. And just to love, to love each other. That's great, you know, because when you sent that message with Ramona to give us a hug, with Roberta. I said Ramona and Ramona. Ramona. Yeah, yeah. Ramona, Ramona, Roberta. Um, I felt like, um, man, you were like right on it, you know, right on it with whatever it was. Because oh, I didn't know. Yeah. And it, before it was just, I even saw you, before you told me about your heart, Yeah. Uh, I was praying. I mean, I was, I was in prayer, and you both you were heavy on my heart. 
and I had that word, and then for some reason I couldn't get there. But. And see, this is amazing because when Dr. Otero told me that that it wasn't that I was born with a defect or anything, but that this is the consequence of all that has happened here for the last 12 years that I've been here. It's been a love thing that's wrecked it. Mm. So you're right on. Feeling the love already. Feeling the love. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, anybody else gets anything on? Welcome to, to share. All right, so verse 8, it says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness, and you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, um, verse 8 where it says, Owe no man anything but love. There's several definitions for that word in the Greek. I'm going to give you some scriptures that you can write down, but I'm not going to go through those. But uh, one of the primary meetings, meetings is to owe someone money. And so debt-free living is a biblical um, goal to reach, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a mortgage. It doesn't mean that, you know, you cannot use debt to your advantage. Um, for example, if you have cards, you can offer them up to get points, things like that. So, um, but God's, it's kind of like you can either get sick and get healed or you can walk in divine health. Okay, so that that's, that's what it is. You can... Uh, have so much prosperity that you become the lender, okay? But to get there, you have to get in the Word and you have to understand what your rights are as far as prosperity and things like that. So the scriptures, Matthew uh, 18, 28 has this word and Luke 7, 41. And then also in Luke 16, 5 and verse 7. And then Philemon 1, 18. Matthew 18, 28, Luke 7, 41, 16, verses 5 and 7, and then Philemon 1, 18. And then it also speaks of being bound or obligated to perform a duty. What is uh, for the nature of the case necessary and what is fit and proper? And that's in 1 Corinthians 7, 3. And the verse in that says that a man is to render to his wife the affection due her and the husband, uh, or in the wife to the husband. And so the gist of this Greek word for that is that it is the nature of marriage makes it necessary to have affection. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you don't like who you're married to, and if there's no affection, it's a little hard to stay married. So this word carries the idea that there are certain things that require certain responses. So like when Kent was a baby, uh, what was due him was that I changed his diapers and feed him and bathe him because he can't do those things himself. And so there's circumstances in life and there are things in life that require a specific response. Okay, so that's what that word means. And so basically he says, don't owe anybody anything but love. Now, I'm going to get more into that because that's a higher law, but it doesn't mean that you just cast off your duties, you know, sit back on the couch, don't ever clean the house, and say, hey, I don't want anybody anything to love. <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to do that. But um, another uh, definition for 1 Corinthians 7.3 is that also um, the context here is the uh, sexual act, but it also applies to kindness and goodwill. So, Basically, if you're married, there ain't no kindness, there ain't no marriage bed either. Okay, so that's what that's talking about. And so God is letting us know that there are things that we are going to need to do. And you can either choose to do them as a law, or you can choose to do them from a place of love. And the thing is, is when you do them as a duty of law, 
what happens is it actually strengthens sin and it strengthens the rebellious nature in uh, people. But if you go to a place of you're doing it from, from love, there is a joy that's involved. Okay? And not only that, there's a faith. And so, um, I, I want to read you this blog uh, post on love from Rick Rare. Okay? There's four words for love. He goes through them all. And then he says, the fourth word for love is the word chiefly used in the New Testament to depict the love of God. And this is a Greek word, agape. And it's this word that Paul uses in Galatians 5.22 when he writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what I call high-level love. There is no higher, finer, or more excellent love than agape love. In fact, oh, stand correct. The word agape is so filled with deep emotion and meaning that it was one of the most difficult words to translate in the New Testament. Trying to explain this word has baffled translators for centuries. Nevertheless, I will now add my attempt to clarify the meaning of this word. Now listen to this. Agape occurs when an individual sees, recognizes, understands, or appreciates the value of an object or a person. Okay? Causing the viewer to look upon this object or person with great esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. Such great respect is awakened in the heart of the observer for the object or person he is beholding that he is compelled to love it. In fact, his love for that person or object is so strong that it's irresistible. Now, that's how God saw us. We were irresistible. Okay? So he wasn't doing like, oh, staying humans, I better go there and say okay, That's not how, he, that did not go down. In the New Testament, perhaps the best example of agape is found in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the phrase, for God so loved the world, the word love, the word love is the word agape. That means when God looked upon the human race, he stood in awe of mankind, even though he was lost in sin. Have you ever looked at a sinner and stood in awe? Nope. <laughs> I don't think I have. Unless it's, you know, Matthew McConaughey or something. But, <laughs> but how bad they were. We always view sin in the sinner. Okay? But a God may love will see the value of that person and stand in awe of who God has created them to be. I think the closest I've ever had that happen is when I was helping. Uh, drug addicts with um, junctions. And I remember looking at them like, you have no idea how great you are. That's why you're so jacked up. <laughs> you know, and so I would try to communicate that the best way I could. So that was probably about the closest. God admired man, and he wondered at man, and he held mankind in the highest appreciation. Even though mankind was held captive by Satan at that moment, God looked upon the world and saw his own image. The human race was so precious to God and he loved man so deeply in his heart that he was stirred to reach out and do something to save him. In other words, God's love drove him to action. You see, agape is a love that loves so profoundly that it knows no limits or boundaries and how far, wide, high, and deep it will go to show that love to its recipient. If necessary, agape love will even sacrifice itself for the sake of that object or person it so deeply cherishes. Agape is the highest form of love, a self-sacrificial type of love that moves the lover to action. So that's very important. With agape love, there is always action. Okay, you can't just sit by. You gotta pray, you gotta reach out, you gotta give, whatever it is, that's how agape manifests itself. But get this. Agape is a love that has no strings attached. It's not looking for what it can get, but for what it can give. It's all the one who is loved is so deep that it's compelled to shower love upon that object or person regardless of the response. This is a profound love God has for the human race, for he loved man when he was still lost in sin with no ability to love him back. God simply loved mankind without any thought or expectation of receiving love in return. And that's important because if we love someone, we want them to love us back. Okay? 
When you love with such a pure love that you expect nothing back in return, it is impossible for you to feel hurt or let down by the response to the recipients of your love. You don't love them for the purpose of getting something in return. You shower them with love simply because you love them. This kind of love is much higher than Eros love that's based in selfishness, Sturdo love that is restricted by limitations, and Phileo love that is rooted in mutual satisfaction. These three types of love are what I call low level, but agape is high level love, no strings attached, simple and pure, the God kind of love. So if you have children, that's that kind of love. You know what I mean? So if you're a mom or, or a dad, you'll know what I'm talking about. In 1 John 3, 16, we are urged to possess agape for each other. It says, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought also, also to lay down our lives for our brethren. This plainly means that we are to love and appreciate each other just as fully and freely as God loves us. The Father loved us to the point of self-sacrifice. Jesus' agape love drove him to lay down his life for us. In the same way, we are to agape our brothers and sisters to such a high extent that we would willingly lay down our lives for them. If we are truly operating in agape and they don't respond in like fashion, it won't offend or hurt us. We're not looking for what others can do for us or how to love others uh, with strings. Therefore, the way other people respond has no effect on our desire to share them, to shower them with agape love. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. This word again is agape, which tells us that when agape is at work, it's a force that is so strong that it demonst demonstrates its deed, itself with deeds and actions. This is not empty love that talks, but does nothing. It is a love that does something, just as God loved us and then did something to save us from our lost and sinful condition. This is a love that Paul urged us to follow when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after agape. The word follow means hotly pursue. This is another one of those messages where I'm like, oh my gosh, I am so far away <laughs> from this reality. Dang it. I thought it would know, be a little bit easier this week. <sighs> it was a hunting term that pictured a hunter following the tracks of an animal until he finally gets his game. This means that attaining this high level of love does not come easy. If we want to attain agape love and rather than walk in it, we will hotly pursue it. It must be the focus and the aim of our lives. If agape is the basis of your relationship, you'll be faithful and a movable friend for life instead of a come and go friend. If agape is driving is driving motivation of your life and force behind all your relationships, it will make you to be the best, the most devoted, faithful, and reliable friend, uh, parent, spouse that anyone has ever known. And so that's why Paul says, "Owe no man anything but love, because God is love, and we have God in us in the nature of Jesus Christ." Uh, Romans 5.5 5, uh, says that hope does not disappoint. And the reason hope does not disappoint is because the love of God has been poured out in our spirit, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. So we have love in us. We don't need to ask for it. We simply need to begin to meditate and say the scriptures on it. Because wherever you meditate, guys, that's where your faith is built. Okay? And, and it can be for good or bad. You know, if you meditate on, uh, let's say, just spiritual warfare and deliverance, then that's where your faith is going to be at. If you meditate on healing and all that, that's where your faith is going to be at. So whatever you're needing, whatever you want to pursue, it will require you to write the scriptures and begin to study it out and begin to pursue it. And so because the fallen nature could not receive agape, because it could not receive the Holy Spirit in their hearts, there had to be penalties and laws. In other words, uh, if you steal from your neighbor, this, this, and this will happen. If you murder someone, if you uh, intentionally did it, you'll be killed. Uh, if you didn't unintentionally, uh, or if you didn't intentionally do it, you can go to a refuge city and be safe. I mean, there's there were all these things. 
because God had to um, put a boundary on sinful man. And that's, just, that's the same thing today. You've got to have boundaries and you have to have penalties. But what he is saying is that because you now have the nature of Jesus Christ in you, you no longer need external, rule, external rules to tell you what to do. Okay? And so, um, like, if I plant an apple seed, I'm going to get an apple. If I plant a banana, whatever, I'm going to get a banana. What would you plant for a banana? Banana tree. A tree. Yeah, but where does a tree come from? What seed? Banana seed. Same seeds? Yeah. Oh, you see them? Don't even see them? Is that what happens? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, where do they come from? Anyway. So, <laughs> the word. <laughs> Produces the same nature. Okay? So, because Christ lives in you, if you cultivate that, if you water that with the Word, if you uh, spend time in the anointing, the anointing is crucial. Uh, if you spend time in the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit, you will by the, the Spirit seed in you of Jesus Christ by itself will produce His nature externally. Okay? So, like, uh, we were telling, um, oh, I've got to share the testimony of this Mayfield. But we were, I was telling her, I said, the word, when you plant it, on its own, it produces fruit. You don't go over there and dig it up to see if it's doing anything, right? You just plant the seed, water the seed, let it get in sunshine, and it naturally produces. The seed is so important. And so what has happened is the Holy Spirit has poured love in us. And as we do the things that the Bible tells us, prayer and the Word and spending time in the presence of the Holy Ghost, allowing Him to show us truth, what will happen is you will naturally begin to produce love. You will naturally begin to produce patience. You know, I, I think we can all look back to when we were first born again to now. Right? And there's change. Yeah. If there's not change, you need to be born again. <laughs> okay? There's change. It's impossible it not to occur unless you absolutely give no attention to the seed. But you know what's interesting? You, I have had morning glories come up every year until the last probably about three years, and I pulled them out in 1998 when we first moved there. <laughs> so the thing is, is that even with seed, if it finds a place and it gets some rain, it'll grow. Right? So the enemy seeks to corrupt the seed. And the way he does it, this is the number one way, is thoughts. Mm -hmm. That is the number one way. Everything begins as a thought. God thought, let there be light. Spoke it, light was released. So what the enemy will do is he'll try to corrupt and mix the seed. Uh, before uh, the angels slept with women in uh, almost said Noah chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, <laughs> before they slept with women, um, seed produced after its own kind. The book of Enoch, which is not canon scripture, but it's his recording of what occurred, is they began to mix seed. They began to mix angelic seed with human seed. They began to do manipulation. Uh, like the centaurs in a lot of the Greek mythology, half horse, half man. Some believe that that's exactly what happened during that time. That's where that idea came from. Okay? And so they tried to corrupt every seed that they could these uh, fallen angels, because you know, they were corrupted when they slept with the women, they, they corrupted the seed, and that's why the Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generations. He was untainted. He was not a mixture. You see the same thing today with Christians. They'll say they're a Christian, they'll go to church, and then you look on their Facebook page, and it's, you know, got the rainbow, you know, like Skittles, something like, the, like Skittles and Dukes of Hazard in your Facebook page. Or they'll say the F this and F that. And, you know, I mean, you're just like, I remember one time I told him, he was a youth. Uh, dude, I won't tell you who. And, um, because Roberta, you'd know. And uh, I said, uh, can you please take off your profile, Christian? I was like, it was, he was particularly ridiculous. I said, because it's embarrassing, me and the Lord. And, uh, and he quit. He straightened up. 
That's mixture. That's not understanding that the old nature has been crucified. Behold, all things are new. And so the enemy will try to mix in with doctrine or temptation or whatever it is, uh, a corruption of your spirit man. And so you have to reckon the fallen nature dead. That's very, very important. And even doctrine will teach you you're still a sinner and things like that. We've talked about it. That's a mixture of the seed. You're either a sinner or a saint. It ain't both ways. Okay? So the reason the enemy did this is the prophecy was a seed is coming who is going to crush your head. Now, the same thing applies now. The seed is in us, and he crushes the enemy's rule. So whenever disease rears its head, no, crush it. Whenever demonic oppression tries to come against you, no, crush it. So we, as the body of Christ, are crushing Satan under our feet, or his feet, okay? And so that's why the enemy seeks to corrupt the seed of Christ in you. If you possess Holy Spirit, you possess love. Now, how does he corrupt the seed of love? If we read Rick Renner's blog about love, you might think, well, maybe I was too hard on my kids when I got on to them, or maybe that person that keeps being rebellious, maybe I shouldn't be so hard on them, or, you know, and we begin to wonder, we begin to go into the phileo aspect of love. We begin to think, well, maybe I should be one of those mushy, gushy love people, okay? But then you would have to dismiss the times where the Lord methodically made the uh, whip and then went into his house and drove them out. Do you think that felt good, being hit by a whip? You'd be like, what on earth? I was just coming here to do my job today. You know? and, and the time where he said, get behind me, Satan. Or the time after he was resurrected and he chewed out his disciples. The word rebuke means to chew up one side and down the other because they did not believe that he'd be raised from the dead. So there are times where love manifests itself as rebuke. Okay? So, you know, I always give Elizabeth a rough time because uh, I say she's a hippie. And uh, so if you have hippiness in you, then you're going to be on this side of, oh, you know, oh, you know and you're going to be uh, an enabler. And then if you're like, you know, the military aspect Christian, <laughs> you'll be like, kill them all. I'm just kidding. But so there is a place in the spirit where you walk in the perfect, uh, the perfect wisdom of when it's time to give grace and when it's time to give rebuke. I remember when Kent was little and he'd get in trouble and you know, he'd be grounded or something. And the Lord would tell me he's truly repented in his heart. You can let him off early. And so I go, no, you're off early. Eyes would light up. He's all excited and stuff, you know. And then other times, the Lord's like, mm -mm, no, he ain't sorry at all. <laughs> he didn't go the whole time. Okay. Because I hate grounding them because that was kind of, I was grounded too. You know, and you don't want to, you know, have to ground your kids. That's what I'm talking about. You know, the Lord will tell you this is a time to, you know, extend grace. This is a time to do it, especially if they confess. If someone confesses sin to you, that is very difficult to do. That right there is an act of repentance. Okay? And so, anyway, love has to be balanced with wisdom. Okay? Because if it's not, then you get over into what is not even God love. You're an enable, enabling people. Love is what is fitting and what is proper because of who now lives in us and the nature we now carry. Now, here's the catch. You can only love your neighbor to the degree that you love yourself. That's the catch. So, well, let me, let me continue here. This is why the enemy does such a good job before you get born again to destroy loving yourself. Yeah. Now, you don't possess agape love before you're born again, okay? Uh, but you do have what's called a self-image. In fact, do you know the word agape is a combination of a noun and verb that was not in existence until Jesus Christ? Did y'all know that? And so, it was, it, love is not existent in your life 
until Jesus Christ. So what the enemy does is he constantly attacks the image that you possess of yourself from the time you are in the womb. Babies can feel it. They know exactly if you want them, they know if you don't want them. All of that trauma, all of that is from the womb on. And so the enemy will attack us to, and, and, and try to get us to either hate ourselves or the other side of it, to love ourselves so much that we're narcissistic. Okay? So it's either hate or nar narcissism. One of those two. The enemy also attempts to stop you loving yourself after you're born again by two ways. Religious, false, humble mindsets, that you're a worm and still a sinner, or condemnation. Okay? Two ways. Religious doctrine telling you that you are a worm, or condemnation. Okay? Romans 7, 24 through 25. Dr. Robin says, why did Paul have to write this scripture? She's going to ask him when she gets to heaven. Oh, wretched man that I am. <laughs> Can you imagine? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Okay. So most people are like, so that, you know, that shows you that. You know, simple nature. It's death. It's like a body of death. You're just a wretched man. Like even the uh, Amazing Grace has saved a wretch like me. I don't like that line. I'm no longer a wretch. I want to change it. <laughs> All those hymns, you know what I mean? I'm a worm. <laughs> I've lost everything. But I will trust you, oh God. You know, it's, it's like ridiculous. You gotta rewrite the whole things. But listen to what else Paul said. But I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul was speaking of the past before he was born again that he was a wretched man. He is not referring to his current condition as a born again believer because he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thank God, Jesus Christ, my Lord, did. And you know what that body of death was? Some of you have heard me talk about it. It's disgusting. It was the Roman uh, and a lot of other ancient cultures. If you murdered someone, they would put the dead carcass on your back, and you had to carry that thing around until the rotting flesh began to eat into your flesh. Is it not disgusting? Ew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> I'm looking for any opportunity to use that. If you ever watched Jimmy Fallon's Ew. So was, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I just, this is really funny because this was our, our devotional Daughters of the King. And this is exactly like what they're talking about. It's like, as you love yourself. And it talks about how he goes through all the passages of how we're supposed to love each other. But then it goes... Um, how are you loving you? Are you patient with yourself, merciful towards yourself? Do you encourage yourself? How you treat yourself is how you will treat others. This is why God desires you to receive his love, his mercy, and his grace constantly. The same you will receive, the same you will give away. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, so you're talking yeah, about... Yeah, once you know. don't possess, you can't give. Right. Um, as a Jew, and even as a non-Jew, I remember being a kid and having the battle within to do what was right and to not do what was right 99.9% .9 of the time I did what was not right and so then guilt guilt becomes like that dead carcass it literally eats away at the revelation that Jesus Christ is in you um, Jesus Christ took all guilt so you are no longer guilty the only time guilt is used is to, uh, as a tool of the Holy Spirit, to let you know that you did something that was not pleasing to Him. But the minute you recognize it and you turn the other way, it's gone. But what the enemy will do is he will beat you up over your sin. And so you need to just stop. The verdict is not guilty. Okay? So, in fact, anything, now listen to this, this is important. Anything that you do that is motivated by guilt is from the fallen mindset. Because religion tells you what is wrong and what is right. Jesus took our guilt. He took our shame. Therefore, anything that is motivating you other than grace is uh, of, the, of the devil, basically. So he doesn't like guilt offering. 
Remember, he said, sacrifice, uh, what is it, sacrifice and offering or sacrifice and burnt offerings you did not take pleasure in, but you have provided a body for me. That was Jesus Christ. You have provided a body for me. Therefore, I can come into the world and deliver man mankind, those who believe in me, from all guilt. So don't insult God by doing things for him out of guilt. That you're wasting your time, actually. Won't even go into your account. And you know, sometimes people can feel that too if you're doing that with them. Have you ever like felt that before? It's like someone, you know, gets mad at you and all of a sudden they're like, hi, you know, and they're trying to, you know, and sometimes people don't know how to communicate, so that's why they're doing that, but you're like, the only reason you're hugging me because you've never hugged me before is because you were a jerk the other day. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we've all done it, we've all been there, but we just need to quit. So there you go. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, some of these scripts do not have this next part. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But actually, it can stay in there. But it's not a condition. Um, all it means is that when you are led of the spirit, you're not given any opportunity for the devil to put condemnation on you. Because in heaven, there is no condemnation. The blood of Jesus is enough. Unless you don't repent. You know what I mean? But the enemy will take advantage of any decisions you make to put you under that cloud of condemnation because he knows that you cannot pray in faith if your soul feels condemned. Okay? So he knows that that will stop prayer. And when you stop prayer, you stop miracles. Have you ever tried to be in the Lord's presence and you did something wrong and you felt condemned? Did it go very well? Right. You might as well just go run around the block for five hours because you're going to accomplish nothing. Sometimes, I remember, there's times where I'm like, oh, and I didn't want to deal with something. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, I need to deal with this, and it's basically a waste of time. You just bring it here in prayer because I'm not ready to forgive yet. So I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm going to work on it, and then I come back in. That's why the enemy does that. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, the law was perfect. Our flesh nature that was fallen was the problem. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to flesh, but according to the scriptures. The fallen nature makes it impossible to please God, and the law of Moses could only reveal what was wrong with us. It could not deliver. Okay? So if the law could have done it, he would have sent his son. And no laws you make up will do it either. Alright? So, it's a little chilly. You guys have blue lips, neat blankets covering yourselves. So, our wretched nature is dead. We now have a new nature. And the righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled. There's nothing left for us to do but love by the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. Now, not loving ourselves is a strategy the enemy employed early through several methods. Number one, rejection. That's the biggest one. Mm -hmm. Everybody's experienced rejection. It doesn't matter if you were the popular teenage prep or if you were, you know, I don't know. Those are the only ones that were the cool kids in school. So, <laughs> yeah, down to the, you know, nerd, I guess. Everyone has experienced rejection on some level. Number two, failure. If you've ever felt the sting of failure, it sucks, right? And so the enemy will really hit our image when we fail. Number three, abuse. Any form. Words, sexual, physical. Do you know... Emotional detachment is a form of abuse and a form of manipulation, okay? So any form of abuse uh, he will use to attack loving ourselves. Number four, legalism in the home. Parents that put rules on their children without demonstrating love um, will actually cause them to not be able to love themselves. They'll feel a need to perform. Uh, 
me and Mike's uh, brilliant son that was raised, you know, so wonderfully by the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, he was asked by his youth pastor once, he says, how are you such a good kid? And the reason why is because pretty much every single kid in youth group was jacked up. And so Kim was almost steady, you know, and on the east. You know, she's steady, steady on. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, my parents had a perfect mixture of discipline and love. Jeez. <laughs> you got that. <laughs> but he was awesome. You know what I mean? I was like, what? And uh, he didn't tell you that. The youth pastor told me that. But that stuck with me. That stuck with me because that's how the Father is with us. When we need discipline, he'll do it. But he'll also demonstrate his love even in the midst of discipline. Okay? Five harsh words. Every time. You know? And sometimes you have to rebuke. But what I'm talking about are words like, you're stupid. You'll never amount to anything. It's where people take what you're doing and make it your identity. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference. Make sure you're not doing that. Okay? Like, someone who lies all the time. They're just such liars. i got someone right now that's irritating me to no end. And I was like, he's a liar. <laughs> it was just so bad. And the Lord's like, you're going to teach him, you know, this tonight. And you're assigning to him identity. And I'm like, well, the shoe fits. <laughs> but it's like we have this idea that our actions become who we are. But actually, the actions are simply a result of the identity we carry on the inside. So if you get the identity fixed, you won't be or you won't do the things that you do. Okay? That's how it works. So if you understand that the enemy is under your feet, you won't have fear. If you understand that you are prosperous and made wealthy by the Holy Ghost because of Jesus Christ, you won't fear lack. Okay? That's how that works. So if you want to fix the things that you're doing that you know are contrary to Scripture, you've got to get your identity fixed. And you have to be careful of the words that you're speaking over yourself as well. Number six, bad relationships. That'll definitely mess up your self-image. Seven, broken marriages. Anyone that's ever been through a divorce, it's hell. And so, you know, the Jewish uh, people, what they do is, you know, their divorce rate is 16%. Do you know that? And the reason why is the ceremony to divorce is so horrible that they would rather just stay married and work out their business. We, we can just go for 500 bucks, get a piece of paper, sign it, done. You know what I mean? And so, broken marriages, financial failures. What the enemy did not tell you, this is his secret, is that all of that was a result of a fallen nature. It's not who you are. It's because of him and coming into agreement with what he says. And it's also the result of a fallen system that he's created and ruled over for almost 6,000 years. Man has a choice, but it requires light shining in the darkness for you to see reality. That's why when the Lord looked at us, he didn't want to condemn us because he understood that every person born after Adam did not choose to be born in a, with a fallen nature. Okay? We didn't choose that. And so he knew that he needed to send a solution, and he did. So now, to not respond to his voice is actually worse than not responding to Moses in the law. And I'll show you that in a minute. So, by faith, now you are, and put this, if you're writing a list, put this next to number one. Accepted. You are absolutely accepted. There is nothing in you that he rejects at all. Number two, successful. You may not feel successful, but you are successful. Number three, cherished. Number four, free from the law. And number five, instead of harsh words, you're sung over by God. He sings over you. That's amazing. Number six, you have peace with God and with man. Not all of them, but a lot. Number seven, you're healed. And number eight, 
you have freedom from lack. Write these scriptures, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, 1628, and 17, 1 through 3. I'm going to read them to you. Now this, this blows me away. When I discovered this, it blew me away. 16 through what? 16, verse 28. What was the other one? 17, 1 through 3. Okay. And did you get Matthew 22? Mm-hmm. 22, and then verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is, You will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Matthew 16, 28. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew 17, 1. Now after six days, which is prophetic of 6,000 years, in case you're wondering, days as a thousand years, thousand years as a day. We're approaching that. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Okay? The word hang is to suspend, and it's the exact Greek word used to describe him as being hanged on wood or the cross. Acts 5.30 and 10.39. Jesus is the son of the law, Moses, and he's also the son of the prophets, Elijah. And he was in the middle. And so he is the source, he is the beginning, he is the end. No one has greater love than to lay down their lives for their friends. And so when he was up on the cross, love was hanging on the cross. On these hang the law and the prophets. The reason Jesus loved himself well is because his identity in the Father was secure. He knew who he was, what he was on earth to do, where he had come from, and where he was going. Now, let me get rid of a myth. Let me get rid of a a false doctrine that has been taught in the church. And that is that Jesus knew everything because he was God. Okay? He didn't. He was man. And he was simply being led of the Holy Spirit. And he would see things beforehand and he would minister. Sometimes he would get his instructions while he's ministering. Sometimes he had to write in the sand to get the answer. Okay? He did not know every single thing that was going to happen. But he was led of the Spirit. And the reason that's important is if you think that he knew everything that was going to happen, then number one, you take away the power of him being led of the Holy Ghost, and you also take the reality away that you are like he was on the earth. Okay? And so I don't have all the scriptures to get into that, but, um, you know, you can say that yourself. Jesus knew the things he knew by two ways, the Word and the Spirit. Now get this. The Holy Spirit unveiled to him as a spirit of wisdom and revelation what the Old Testament scriptures said about him. Now this is incredible. Can you imagine you're reading about yourself and he had to take it by faith how does faith come by hearing the word right he had to take it by faith so he saw isaiah writing about the fact the messiah would be born in bethlehem check <laughs> isaiah 7 7 14 a, a, a virgin behold a virgin will uh, conceive a son and they'll call him emmanuel check you know so he began to read the scriptures with the understanding of the holy spirit And actually, because he was a rabbi, he had all of the Old Testament memorized. So that by the time he was spirit-filled, when he was baptized with water, all of it was there. You know, the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what this meant. He read David's writings about being betrayed and people mocking him at his death. He read Daniel's prophecy that the Messiah would be cut off, which is actually a word that means to die a criminal's death. He knew that he would take on sin, pain, and sickness, according to Isaiah 53. And he also knew that he needed to be silent, like a lamb led to the slaughter. He learned that he was to refuse the bitter drink they would give him. 
on the cross because it was dry and it would lessen the pain. And he also knew to give up his spirit at exactly 3 p.m. when the Passover lamb would be slaughtered because the scripture said to All of that came from the word. It's the same thing for us. We're called to live on that level of revelation and spirit and power. Unfortunately, many Christians do not say the word on any level of death that can bring those kind of results. Instead, many of us live in bitterness and offense, ignorant and forgettable of the great, forgetting the great salvation given to us. And you know what's amazing is, like I've been pondering this. I posted it on Facebook. I hear people, especially people that get divorced, you know, they immediately get into a relationship and they begin to have sexual relations. And they're like, well, I have needs. All right, let me ask you a question. Was Jesus male? Mm -hmm. Do males have testosterone? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the reality is that because the Lord was a man, he could have said that he has needs. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he did not let love awaken. Because that was not his purpose. And so we have people that because they don't understand that as Christ was on the earth, so are they. Because they don't understand that, they lessen their identity to a level that is fleshly and carnal. So instead of coming up to the reality of Jesus Christ being an example of who we are, they're like, well, I have needs. But here's the thing. There's a scripture in Ecclesiastes that scared the you-know-what out of me. And it said... Man's heart grows more wicked because judgment is delayed. See, we think that God, like maybe he's not paying any attention or something like that. The fact is he is so merciful. He will go to extremes in patience to get people to stop and repent. But there comes a point where that cup of iniquity is full enough to where now judgment has to come. Okay? And so that's what happens. Listen to this. A lot of people are like, man, I sure am glad I wasn't born in Moses' day. Gosh, you got stoned to death if you're rebellious to your parent. I know I would have been killed. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> me and my mom, well, we get fist fights, me and my stepmom. And uh, I won one too. But anyway. <laughs> um, so Hebrews 12, 14. I'm going to read this. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one.